Hey, what's up, garden friends? Jeff here. How's everybody doing? Hope you're doing well. I'm great. This thing, it doesn't stop. It's all, ow, ow. <laughs> what do you think you're doing? It's not time to start the video yet, but she was being really cute. And I have a tendency to forget to record the animals. So I thought I would show off the kitten. Look at how big she's gotten. You're getting freaking huge. It's only been two weeks at this point. And she's gigantic. Okay, we're not, we're not, I'm not going to entertain that. Where's her toy? Here, take a toy. I also need to go get her toys that don't have feathers on them because that could be problematic with having a parrot that she likes to hunt and stare at like she wants to eat. I don't want you to eat Cosmo. You get the camera. You get the camera. Say hi to everybody. Yeah, like I said, this is not an appropriate start to the video because I'm not actually doing anything right now, but she was being cute. I thought y'all might want to see the kitten being cute. Very cute kitten. She's doing well. I, th there's, I don't know. There's lots of stuff to do this week. I think tomorrow I'll be able to show you the pool. The pool might be done tomorrow. That would be exciting. Work on some planters and do some stuff outside. What's about to happen, pumpkin? <laughs> oh, you're in trouble. You're going to get it. She'll mess you up. Don't do it, kitten. I think she's, oh, I was about to say she's backing off. I don't know if she's backing off. You're going to do it. Oh, you're going to get your ass beat. Here you go, pumpkin. That's right, you show her. You okay, kitten? You're about to give it to Toby too, huh? Cat has zero fear. You know what I mean by how big she's getting? I think I mentioned that in the previous clip. I could hold her in one hand so easily just two weeks ago, and now she's already almost as big as pumpkin. You gonna come through here, kitten? Nope. Oh, she's over there. Now she's going over there. She's gonna do it again. You never learn, do ya? You're just gonna keep going for it. That was too much zoom. Too much. I didn't need to go in that far. Gonna get in trouble. She's gonna get you as soon as she realizes you're down there. Yep. At least she's not afraid of pumpkin. It's very clear at this point. Pumpkin has come a long way. Just maybe a few days ago, she wouldn't even be in the same room as the kitten. Now they kind of hang out together. Not quite, but they're doing cat things within the vicinity of each other. Like they lie around in the same areas. So pumpkin likes to lay on the landing of the, one of the staircases and the kitten will sit a couple steps above her. They're not sharing a cat tree yet, but they'll get there. They're not that far away from that. What did you lose? What's in there? Is there anything in there, Turbo? You're just moving things around all over the place for no reason? That's a heat pad. If you were wondering what's going on there, it's a heat pad. It gets cold in here, that's why the heat pad. Where are you going, kitten? Well, the pool company did show up and the pool is finished. It just now, maybe 20 minutes ago, finished filling up to where it needs to be with water. So I've got the filters and everything all primed up, missing some parts that are necessary. They lost a lot of parts and pieces to the pool. I don't know, what, where'd everything go? Oh, it's okay, Bunkin. I was just gonna show everybody the pool. Don't worry about it. I wasn't gonna do anything to you. See, look, there's water. It's kind of clear-ish considering that it's full of leaves. It was very windy today. There were leaves blown out of that oak tree, just nonstop. So I had to scoop the pool a few different times. I'm sorry, do you not want to be pet right now? I think maybe she wants to be left alone. I really would have loved to have been filming outside today, but it was just, it was too noisy because there were all the pool people here. I'm getting some kisses. Look at that. Thanks, Pumpkin. You such a sweetheart. Thanks for the kisses. Thank you so much. There are people out there. And then of course, the same day the pool gets finished, the neighbor's construction crew showed back up. They've been gone for like a month because apparently there are some issues with some permits or something. I don't, I don't know. I don't know what's going on up there. Uh, actually, I do know I've got a lot of tea, but I'm probably not going to be sharing all that because it just doesn't seem uh, like a, something that a kind person would do, even though it's really tempting. I want to talk about all the drama that's been going on up there with that construction company. So that really isn't necessary because I've had enough drama going on with my own construction stuff. Regardless, the pool's done. Hopefully we'll be able to go out there in the morning and have a look at things outdoors when there aren't people everywhere. There's kids playing basketball up there right now. Almost five o'clock and the construction crew's still up there with a bobcat. It's very loud. And uh, there's nobody in my yard for a change. Oh, the umbrella broke. <laughs> Again, of course, see it flapping in the wind. I don't care, I give up on umbrellas. It's been a while since hung out with just the pets and just had a nonsense vlog. I don't actually know what that was supposed to mean to think every vlog is somewhat nonsensical. What'd you do with the kitten? What'd you, oh, there she is. There's the kitten. <laughs> Little murder mittens over there, my legs covered in scratches and scars from that monster. She's a nice kitten, very sweet, very snuggly. And that's about all there is to all that. I think Pumpkin's been waiting for me to move these because she wants to jump over here and get on the desk. Yep, that's what I thought. Wanting some laptop time. She likes to lay on top of the laptop. 
Usually only when I'm working, though. Yeah, see, so that's the thing. She doesn't want to play with the kitten, but she really enjoys watching her. She likes seeing what that little maniac's going to be up to at all times. Uh, I know there's an excess of lava lamps here. Just, it's fine. This one is from my chop. They're both from when I was a kid, but this one's a dye faded out on, because apparently you're not supposed to let the sun hit them, which I didn't know I'd put again. Uh, you see, this is another reason it's hard for me to go outside and vlog. My pets are acting like they haven't seen me in years today, and I don't know what that's about, but it makes me feel bad for leaving them. That one. I don't really care about the Coca-Cola stuff, but it's just that northern Arctic look to it. Isn't it beautiful? They even put little imperfections in the glass. It looks like stars. It's supposed to be like a starry night scene. Arctic polar bears. I got They're still going at it. You see that? I'm trying to keep the person's face out of the shot because that seems really weird and rude to film someone and they don't know it. It's getting dark out there and they still got that skid steer. Bobcat. It's a bobcat. So it's bobcat on it. Going up and down that hill. Uh, hey, they may have taken all summer to do something, but at least when they showed up to work, they come to work. What did you get? To She's under the rug. Why are you under the rug? <sighs> OK, anyways, you guys want to talk about something exciting? Have you all heard about the new USDA zones? That was what I came up with to talk about since can't really go outside and get anything done. That's fine. We can talk about the new zone map. Or did you know about this is exciting stuff? Very exciting stuff. We have new zones. I think my ADD has settled enough and the pets may have settled enough that we can go ahead and talk about it. You want to see the map? Here it is. Look at that. I have the map up here, which I'll put up on the screen. and I'm going to read off parts of the statement from USDA on what's going on here. Throw this up so everybody can look at it, see what zones you're in. I'm going to link this down below if you want to go in and play around with it, put in your zip code, see where things are and what may have changed. The map came out November 15th from the USDA, this time the map is much more detailed. So that's why a lot of our zones have changed. 2023 map is based on 30 year averages of the lowest annual winter temperatures at specific locations. It's divided into 10 degree Fahrenheit zones and further divided into five degree Fahrenheit half zones, meaning zone A or zone B. So 7A, 7B, 6A, 6B. This one has an interactive format, just like the old one did. This one has several new significant features and advances. That's what they're saying. The 2023 map incorporates data from 13,412 weather stations compared to the 7,983 that were used for the 2012 map. Areas like Alaska have much more detail because they are taking into account elevations and the mountains and a lot more data to represent things. This is important to note. Most of y'all probably know this, but I should say it anyways. Plant hardiness zone designations represent what's known as the average annual extreme minimum temperature at a given location during a particular time period, being 30 years. But another way, the designations do not reflect the coldest it has ever been or ever will be at a specific location, but simply the average lowest temperature for the location over a specific time. Low temperatures during the winter is a crucial factor in the survival of plants at specific specific locations. Then they explain the map, just like the 2012 map, the new version has 13 zones across the United States and its territories. Each zone is broken into half zones designated as A and B. Here's where things get really interesting and this is why this is exciting. When compared to the 2012 map, the 2023 version reveals that about half of the country shifted to the next warmer half zone and the other half of the country remained in the same half zone. That shift to the next warmer half zone means those areas warmed somewhere in the range of zero to five degrees Fahrenheit. However, some locations experience warming in the range of zero to five degrees Fahrenheit without moving to another half zone. Then they explain that these national differences in zonal boundaries are mostly a result of incorporating temperature data from more recent time period. The 2023 map includes data measured at weather stations from 1991 to 2020. And there's a lot of explanation in here talking about how the 2023 map for Alaska is warmer in quotation marks than the 2012 version. That's mainly because the new map uses more data representing the state's mountain regions. Where during winter, warm air overlies cold air that settles into low elevation values, creating warmer temperatures. There's some backpedaling in here, or I don't want to say backpedaling, but you can tell that the language that's being used is being very careful. It seems as if they want to make sure that this new map isn't being used by people as a tool to say, oh, what well, climate change. That sort of thing when they're saying eh, this is really more than likely just a better representation of how things have been, though they are slightly warmer. Some areas are not slightly warmer. This is more about gardening than what's going on globally. That's what I surmise from 
the rest of this is they're basically saying right in here. Consequently, map developers involved in the project cautioned against attributing temperature updates made to some zones as reliable and accurate indicators of global climate change. I wanted to make sure that point was there and there are multiple paragraphs above it that were leading up to it. So did your zone change? I had that up there on the screen for a while. Did you go over and look and see if your zone changed? It said over half of the country or around half the country shifted. And that's largely because of better data collection and probably some warming. That wouldn't surprise me one bit. I'm not gonna put my zip code because I'm not looking to get docs here, but we can zoom into the St. Louis region. That's where I am. We have been 6A, 6B. You can see where there's a shift here. It used to be that like 6B was like a little sliver that went through here. And now that's 7A. So St. Louis, I am now officially a zone 7-er. I am part of the zone 7 club. Can't grow magnolias and crepe myrtles for crap, but apparently I live in zone 7. That was an exaggeration. That's largely just my yard. Cold air settles in my yard. There are plenty of crepe myrtles and magnolias around here, but not like when I think of real zone 7, like Tennessee zone 7 and the big, beautiful gorgeous crepe myrtles. No, because every few years we have a freeze that's usually below zero, which shouldn't be happening in zone seven, and it kills them. Crepe myrtles have soft wood, so when it expands and contracts, expands and contracts, you have freezing, long durations of freezing, they die down to the ground. So you can still grow them, just not as great big trees. You don't see them that often here. Where you do their points up against buildings, it's just not the same. It's a different vibe. You can see how the St. Louis and then over into the Illinois side, there's this warmer area, mostly right along the Mississippi River, which makes sense. And then there's also the heat island effect of the city and where things are moving from being more of a plain and a valley to more hilly. Once you leave the St. Louis area, things start to flatten out or the hills get more broad. Maybe it's how I should describe it. So it's like they're there and they're really big, but they're not as noticeable. Keep forgetting the new computer's not a touch screen. Things are more flat. That's why it's St. Louis gateway to the West because really once, not really when you get to St. Louis, when you leave St. Louis, it's very Western, very flat and very dry, or -er, more so when you get towards Kansas City and move into Kansas, but still, you get the point. Better data collection, more accurate representations of microclimates, which is great. That's really exciting. I've talked to some of y'all. You'll shift it from like 8A to 8B, some people from 8B to 9A. I'm going to close this now, but I'll have that linked down below for everybody to look at. And you can play around with it. Comment down below. Did your zone change? What does that mean to you? To me, it just makes more sense. I've been growing zone seven plants in my garden for years now. My main apprehension with this or the main thing that I could see being a downside has nothing really to do with much of anything anybody would relate to, but I have so much on my channel about gardening in zone six and I'm a zone seven-er and I've talked so much in my videos like, hey, I'm in St. Louis, zone six, A, six, B. Well, now that's not even true. And uh, I know y'all know and y'all are understanding, but people in the future who watch the videos from the past, they're going to see that and be like, oh, he doesn't even know what zone he's in. He's stupid, like that kind of stuff. That's going to get annoying really fast. Those are just the joys of working on the internet, though. Anytime a plant name changes, then people go and watch those videos and like, that's not what the plant's called anymore. I'm like, look at when the video was made. This video's from like eight years ago, dummy. I digress. So there's going to be some of that. I did have a whole video that was almost finished. Um, I was almost finished editing it about my favorite cold hardy plants for zone six. And I was going to do a garden tour of my zone six garden. Uh, and I refer to it as my zone six garden a lot. So I'm probably just going to scrap that or figure something else out with it. I feel like I might lose some cred when it comes to the cold hardy garden stuff being a zone seven or now that really sucks. I hope that's not the case. It just hits different when you're hearing somebody talk about cold hardy plants. And they say they live in zone seven. It's like, oh, well, it's not really that cold there, right? All zones are not created equally. That's going to be a thing that we all have to remember. Like Tennessee zone seven. Not the same as St. Louis Zone 7. Stability and duration has so much to do with what can be grown. And uh, things are pretty wonky here because I live in the smack dab middle of the country and you get air from above and air from below and it's just, things are always shifting around. Oh, but there were, there were other things I was gonna talk about though. Why did I close my computer? Plants, that's the most exciting part. So the one thing that does make a difference is that why am I doing? Stop touching the screen, you dumbass. You know it's not a touch screen. There are plants that I have wanted that nurseries oftentimes won't order because they're like, well, that's not for our zone, that's for zone seven. Like you can grow the majority of zone seven plants here. Not all of them, but a lot of them. 
the Baby Grand Magnolia. This has been on my wish list for a while. It's a really cool magnolia. It's a dwarf, okay? It only gets eight to 10 feet. I'm gonna put this up on the screen. Look at it. Isn't that cool? It's a shrub. It's a giant shrub for magnolia that only gets eight to 10 feet tall. It's beautiful and I want it in my life, but Monrovia still thinks I'm in zone six. That hasn't updated yet. There is one problem though. Yeah, it's $330. So perhaps we'll start seeing some plants if your zone has shifted that maybe you weren't seeing before. When you actually shift zones, for a lot of people may have just gone from like 5A to 5B or 6A to 6B. But if you were one of the Bers who went up to the next A group, certain big box stores, Lowe's and Home Depot, maybe Menard, Maynard, Men Menards, is that how we say it? I don't know, I don't go there, I haven't been there before. A lot of the inventory is based off of the growing zone. So might start seeing some more zone seven type plants in the nurseries, might even, get moved to being what's considered one of the southern regions for the big box stores which would be awesome might start getting some cooler plants that maybe we'll start getting the same stuff i'm seeing when i drive just like 50 miles south and get the heliconians and the gingers and those fun things at the stores who knows there was a big shift in what was available from the nurseries between 2010 and like 2014 in that time period and that's largely because the 2012 map came out in that time period and uh, zones were shifted at that time and the nurseries around here started getting in some neater plants. You weren't finding Akubas or crepe myrtles very often at all at the nurseries prior to 2010 around here. You saw them sometimes, but it was very rare. Never Akubas, never saw any Akubas. Those were considered a more tender plant for zone six and the, some of the camellias and those things. So now might just be getting a bigger and better variety of plants. That's really the only actual change that might come from this new map, right? It's not like this is a forecast for the future. It's just really a better representation with more data points, nearly double the data points of what they had in the past to really show what your climate may be like in your area. That being said, OK, I'm in zone seven. Still have to protect my shrubs, laurel hedges, die on occasion when it gets too cold. The crepe myrtles and magnolias talk about all that. I mean, heck, sable miners die here sometimes because you just don't know what you're going to get. So, uh, yeah, I'm a zone seven or now, but that really doesn't change anything. She's tipped her toy on top of the other toy and she's playing with it through the hole. This kitten, she never stops. I love her so much. When I saw the new map, my first thought was along the lines of, oh, I'm gonna go buy so many windmill palms and plant them outside because I'm a zone seven or now. And in zone seven, you don't have to do as much to protect them. Like I let my brain go off into a fantasy land. Well, it got dark really fast. That, that's not realistic, right? That's not how this really works. So ultimately my takeaway is, we have better representation now, better data collection, which is really important with science for people's climates, at least as far as the annual extreme cold, right? They don't factor in the warmth and all those things, which I wish that there was a better system where warmth and those things were taken into account and blended together. But well, there actually are, but they aren't really widely used or understood or like assigned to categories given to plants for gardening. So it wouldn't be that useful. We have more reliable resources to help us pick out our plants, which is nice and understand our climate for where we live. That's fantastic. And maybe there will be some changes in some varieties of plants sold at the nurseries. But then that raises the question of should there be? I don't really know if there should be. If the nurseries here start getting flooded with a lot of zone seven plants and then they remember, oh wait, but this is still St. Louis. And yeah, okay, it might be zone seven, but we could very easily have multiple days that drop below zero. Ice storms and all those things. And sometimes we'll go weeks on end without ever being above 32 degrees Fahrenheit. Those aren't really zone seven vibes, you know? Since we're only taking into account the extreme cold. So while I would love to start filling my yard with windmill palms, I know that it's not, still not a great idea, right? If anything that this just tells me, if we're zone seven, maybe windmill palms aren't as hardy as we thought they were. Maybe those are more of a zone eight plant. <laughs> not really, I know that that just pissed a whole lot of people off, that's not what I meant, but it does change some things, right? There are a lot of plants that are listed as zone seven. They're not gonna grow here, not very well. And that may be the case for some of y'all. And that's where the comment section comes in handy. Let us know if you can think of things like that where your zone has changed and now there are plants that potentially are listed to grow where you live but you know that they're not going to do well maybe you've tried them you've seen other people try them and it just doesn't work out there might be some scrambling for a while trying to put the pieces together all right that was fun 
all caught up on the zone map. We got to watch the kitten play, got to do some plant nerd stuff. And now tomorrow we'll go outside and do some plant stuff in the garden. I don't know how much we'll be able to actually get done because more than likely there's going to be a lot of noise out there, but try and do something get a better look at the pool. Maybe do some cleanup, plant some kales and cabbages. I don't know, something like that. I, I know I said we'd pick up tomorrow, but look at how good they're being. This is what I was talking about earlier about how they're just kind of being cats near each other. Right, pumpkin? You don't mind being around her. You just don't want her to look at you and touch you too much, right? Been doing lots of positive association work. So when they hang out like this, usually give them some treats. They just said there's some cat treats over there. Just gave them both some. So it's like, hey, look, when you're together, you get treats and you get to have food and you get snugs. You get lots of loves and snugs. It's all very selfish of me, by the way. I just think that it'll be fun for me someday to look back and get to see Pumpkin and the kitten and the beginning stage. They grow so freaking fast. Before you know it, she's going to be an adult. I don't want to remember what it was like that, what, three weeks to a month that she was tiny. Pumpkin too, because she's, I'm not going to say an old lady, but she is a senior citizen. Has a geriatric diet, 11 years old. So you have to do those things. Yeah, you tell them. Turbo, you know better. What are you doing? No kitty. I'd bop you too if you came and put your nose in my face. I wouldn't really. I would never bop you. I would never bop you. You do what you good boy. Yes, you are. Oh, is that quiet? You can't hear anything? It's because there's no audio. It's the no audio. I, it's the next day. Did everything I said I was going to do in the prior clip. Went outside and got everybody caught up on what's been going on over the last like seven weeks when I haven't been filming outside and showed off the pool. And there's no, I have like 40 minutes of footage here and no audio, nothing. I don't know why. I have no, it's, there's no, I'm, my camera was peaking. I'm not peaking, but there's a, a viewfinder there's a screen on the back of the camera and you can see when your audio is moving it was moving i always check it almost always check it there have been mishaps before where i have filmed and turned out my mics weren't connected but they were connected so i don't i whoa i don't know what i'm gonna do here oh screw it i guess we're just gonna do it again right pop this memory card out this time taking the headphones with me hooking those to the camera to make sure that i can actually hear what's coming through figure that out and uh, I can't redo the work that I did but we can talk about it and I have some footage I can overlay of the work that I did. This video has turned out to be a mess. Wasn't supposed to be. It was just supposed to be like, hey look, kitten, USDA map and then go outside and do some gardening. Oh, and the construction crew's back. I squeezed my filming into while they were gone so it was quiet but it's very loud out there now. Oh well, we'll just go outside and play more catch up. There are plenty of updates to give just won't be as many activities, but that's all right. There'll be more activities for next week. Work on things over the weekend when there's not a construction crew out there. Although I realized this construction crew, they were here at like 6.45 this morning, so they might show up this weekend. They might be here all weekend. And that's, I just have to work through the noise and it's fine, everything's fine. We'll go outside and get it right this time. Okay, audio, this is working. This is working this time. Hey, Pumpkin, how you doing? Pumpkin, showing off your pumpkin, Pumpkin. Nice big yawn from the kitten. You stole Pumpkin's cat tree. Oh, you haven't seen this camera before, have you? What is this? What is the thing? The thing's crazy looking. I don't want to scare you. I'll back off. You good girl. You gonna come outside? Come on, Turbs. Okay, let's try this again. In a more brief, summarized version of everything that I'd already done out here. Pool's done, for the most part. There's still some missing pieces. I think because the project took so long, you know, seven weeks, that's a long time. I don't know where some of the things are. Like there's supposed to be these blue frames that go over the skimmers on the side. So that white, that's supposed to be blue. I don't, I don't know, not thrilled with the pool company, but I'm glad that this is done. The uh, bleached out spot on the liner, really can't even see it with the water in the pool. So I'm not stressing over it. It's fine, that's not a big deal. As far as things that I did in the video, I planted up the kales and cabbages, or actually I'm pretty sure it's all cabbages that are in these containers. Underneath these spring grove arbs, these containers have been pulled out several feet from the edges of the pool for the last several weeks. Same things with these gingers down here and those hydrangea trees, everything had been pulled away from the edge of the pool. So I got those cleaned up and tidied, planted up, pushed them back to the edge. It looks much nicer now. The way it's supposed to, that's just a random piece of ginger. I don't know why I stuck that there. Just a little something extra to look at during the winter time. It's nice to have that extra color. Who knows how they'll do the temperatures being up and down so much. 
greatly affects how those cabbages pull through the winter. We'll see what happens with them. I don't have high hopes, but usually you get a couple of nice months out of them. And then around February, they start to rot out and look pretty gross, but that's really not a big deal because in March, you start popping pansies and spring annuals into the containers. So don't really care about that. The gingers that are down here, the alpinias, the rumbuts by the dolphins, those were about 50% brown maybe even more than that because of the cold snap we had late October. So I got the majority of that dead stuff cut out of them and pushed them back up against the dolphins. So there's now a path, a walkable path again around the pool that's been all cluttered up with construction stuff by those dolphins for a while. It's good to have that opened up again. I dug up the, <laughs> I don't want to go down there because there's like seven or eight construction dudes with just like 30 feet away on their side of the hill. It's weird, I don't want to go down there. But I dug up the alocasias, the Borneo giants that were planted on each side of the steps and cut them back. My plan with those had been to put them into just like big paper bags, yard waste bags, but uh, they have some winter damage on them. So I don't think that's the right move. because That could mean they just end up rotting away. I probably need to pot them up, which I don't want to do because they take up so much space in the grow room, but I think it's what I should do, or at least till they open up a couple of leaves and then maybe try and push them back into a dormancy and then put them into the bags and throw them in the basement. I don't know, we'll see what I decided to do with that. We got planes and bobcats going now. Oh, that one's cruising. And everything in the garden is cut back and ready to be mulched. Bananas are cut back, gingers, all that fun stuff. It's mostly just been a lot of cleaning and tidying out here over the last several weeks. A lot of leaf collecting, sweeping, raking, all the fun stuff. Have a pallet of mulch in the driveway that's ready to go down on everything, which is good because the low next Wednesday evening is 19 degrees. Talk about a drop. It was like 75, I think, yesterday. It was 61 or 62 when I came out here and filmed this morning. It was very nice. Then it got breezy and cold. My temperatures are starting to drop and starting to feel more like November. It's been unseasonably warm. So I can't really complain about that because it was nice having a warm front here for a while and uh, I don't mind the cold to an extent, right? Sweater weather can be really comfortable. I think the main thing to focus on here is the pool. It's done, it's running. As of last night, it was done filling up, got things balanced back out, the machinery, everything seems to be working fine and it's looking good. The water's still a little murky because that's just kind of the nature of when you fill it up and the salt dissolves everything that goes into it. But that'll clear up in a couple of days and it'll get covered up and shut down in probably two to three weeks, something like that. But for now, keeping it heated because we want to swim in it. Got a lot of exercise to do. And just having the sound of the water out here again, it's so nice. October was just a wash out here because there was no pool. I miss having the sound of the water and then there were people out here constantly and people up there, not constantly, but off and on. They weren't here a lot, at least not the last three to four weeks or something like that because they're waiting on permits something. And go figure as soon as I'm ready to start filming out here again because my crew leaves, their crew shows up too. That's nice, we're in sync, that's great. Oh, and painted the cushions with the Rust-Oleum fabric paint. It's something I've never used it before. I learned by the time I got to the third cushion that putting down a very light layer, allowing that to dry, and just doing that over and over again is the best way to do it and to keep that hand moving. It's like the second you stop, it starts to get streaky. It's difficult to get it to go on evenly. This one could still use another coat. I don't think I'm going to bother though, because here's the thing about it. Two things about it. It smells terrible. It's been a few days since I did this and it's nauseating. Like the spray paint fumes, they're not going away. And I don't like the way it feels. It feels gross. You can see this cushion that I'm sitting on I flipped it over. I didn't want to sit on that. It just, it feels chalky and sticky. Um, I don't know how to describe it. It doesn't feel sticky. That's not the right word. It's fully dry. There's almost an itch to it. I don't know if that's really the right way to describe it. It doesn't feel nice. This feels sleek and smooth. This feels gross. That's not something I want on my body, but I'm glad to have done it. So it looks better. <laughs> I like the blue better than the beige. Uh, ultimately, I'm just going to be putting new cushions on this in the springtime, hopefully. So I don't really care. Just something I did for Jits and Shigs. Wanted to see how well the product worked. I think that the rust fabric paint would be a great thing to use for, say, umbrellas, canopies, maybe even decorative pillows, cushions. Uh, I don't know. And that could have just been the way it reacted with this fabric, too. 
can't say that's how it works for absolutely everything, but for out here, uh, I didn't, I'm not really crazy about it in this application. And then uh, after giving all those updates, came over here and started to talk about what I want to do over here and then decided that I'm going to wait till next week on this project. I want to get things cleaned up, get all these gingers cut out and have just a nice semi evergreen seating area to enjoy on the warmer days of the winter. We don't have a lot of them, but when we do have them, it's nice to be able to come outside and relax and have a place that's more inviting. So there's still a lot of winter damage over here. I decided to hold off on this area because I'd already done some other stuff that doesn't matter because there's no audio for it, but because it looks like it's gonna cool off for a lot of people next week. And then there's the holiday Thanksgiving. So the Saturday after that, like, I think I would enjoy if I were a viewer watching a video where somebody's out doing something and cleaning and you just kind of get that refreshing, energized feel when you watch those things. That's how I am anyways. Figured next weekend would be better for all of that anyways. We're gonna talk about some possible greenhouse options, some evergreen planters, just things to do out here so that things look more lively during the winter time. Overall, things already are looking more lively during the winter time. I think all of the evergreens I've been slowly incorporating to the garden over the last few years that's starting to add up and build up and look nice. It won't look great when there's a cover over the pool, but that's okay. That's only for a few months out of the year. There'll be some big piles of mulch and <laughs> things that aren't that attractive to look at, but overall things are definitely improving and there's some fun stuff to work with out here too and that's where i'm going to go ahead and wrap it up can't recap everything because there's a lot of stream of consciousness going on while i was potting these things up and doing other projects out here and it was mostly related back to the usda zone changes so you know we already talked a lot about that comment down below though i think i already said that before about your zone did it change how do you feel about it I'm on the fence about us being a zone seven. It sounds nice. I'm a zone seven or now, but I still have to behave as if I'm in zone six. Yeah, lots to figure out and talk about there. I also have a really exciting plant coming in the mail today. So that's the other reason I'm wrapping this up because I have to conserve my voice. I already did so much filming that it was useless to this video, but at least got the background stuff. I had video to overlay. Got to see something. But the, this plant, it's one I'm really excited about. It'll be in Wednesday's video, so I'm trying to conserve my voice for when that gets here too, because I still got a whole nother thing I gotta do. And this whole area, can't wait to get it cleaned up. I work on that over the weekend. It's supposed to be a beautiful weekend like in the 50s and 60s. It'll be nice to be out here and get some things done before things really cool off and start to feel more like November. And maybe there won't be a construction crew up the hill. I don't know, They these guys are, they're working hard. They show up like 6.45, 7 o'clock this morning. So I'll be surprised if they're here over the weekend. But the last, I was gonna say several weeks, several months, I've been trying to do a lot of my filming on the weekends because usually there's not a construction crew out here with all the beeping and everything in the background. This isn't too bad though. There are a few noisy moments, but it's been pretty quiet. Okay, comment down below. Hope everybody's doing well. What's going on in your gardens? Doing houseplant things, poinsettias, amaryllis. What's going on? And of course, as always, and most importantly, everybody, keep on growing. That's a sad looking leaf. Why didn't I choose that one? I should have chosen one of the newer, more fresh ones. I know, frond, not leaf. Bye, bye.